Children's Church, three to seven. Children can be dismissed to Children's Church. Today we're finishing something up. I, this has been a really good study for me. I don't know about you, but this has been good for me. And we are back in 1 Samuel, chapter number 17. Today is the third part. It's the final part, but it, each of these have stood alone. And so this one is also a standalone message. So far, what we have talked about is very important. The weapons of our warfare are not, are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. How many of y'all realize that this is what we desperately need to learn in our generation? Amen. Folks, right now, this morning, with Israel being attacked and them being at war, I want you to understand that as quickly as that happened for them, please understand something like that could happen to us. It could happen just as quickly. And we must understand that there are no guarantees, there are no certainties in this world that we have. But our weapons as Christian people are not carnal. Now, if somebody tries to break in your home, you take whatever weapon you got and you deal with what you got to deal with. But when we're talking about spiritual issues, we don't go out to kill our enemy. We go to show them the truth of Jesus Christ. And don't forget, we're accounted as sheep to the slaughter all the day long. So when you understand that and you learn that and you grasp that, you'll know what that verse actually means. That God in you is all you need. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. How many of y'all have read that verse? How many of y'all quote that all the time? But how many of you really put that into practice? You know, it's something we as Americans, we don't do very often, do we? We have that idea of might is right, and might is not always right. Sometimes the weakest is what is the greatest. Why the five stones we talked about this? According to 2 Samuel 21, Goliath had four relatives, probably brothers, um, maybe that's why he got the five stones. Maybe he just picked up five because he wanted to make sure he got the job done. I don't know. But we do know in the future, David uh, was obviously ready to kill them all. And eventually all four were defeated by the Israelites in battle. Uh, while David defeated Goliath, he was teaching us how to defeat some giants that come up against us. And we talked about these the last two weeks. The first one was the giant of doubt. Uh, as Goliath insulted the men, we understand that we're living in a day where the church is not readily accepted and liked and loved. Am I right? Uh, the, the power of the church is a thing of the past. We're living not only in a post-modern culture, we're living in a post-Christian culture. We are living in a culture that is very much um, idolatry. We're living in a culture that's pagan and hedonistic. Sexuality overruns everything in our culture. We overcome doubt through God's promises, and you got to get in the Bible to find out what they are, don't you? The second one was the giant of despair. Despair is a loss of hope and a loss of expected victory. Folks, victory is already ours in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we need to understand that. And so this giant of disproportion we talked about last week, looking at what we're up against, folks, we're up against it. We are up against it. We are in the minority now. Guess what? We've always been in a minority. People say, boy, I wish I lived at such and such time when the church was strong. It was easier to be a Christian. It's never been easy to be a Christian. It might have been easier to be a church member in the times past, but it's pretty easy to be a church member now and not a Christian. Come on, y'all. That disproportion has always been there. It always will be there until we're glorified. Notice this, when you got that giant of doubt, it's God's promise. Giant of despair, it's God's grace and mercy. That giant of disproportion, you need to rely on the power of Almighty God. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in this world. And today we start out with this giant of distrust. And I'm going to read this to you. Uh, 1 Samuel 17, verse 40, down through verse number 50. We're going to pray and we're going to see what God has for us on this day. And folks, I want you to understand this. This is today. We cannot live on the blessings of yesterday. We need them fresh today. And we need to live for God today. And we need to make a determination in our heart and our life today that we're going to live for God. We're going to live for God this week. Don't trust your eyes. Don't trust what you see. 
Don't trust your ears. Don't trust what you hear. Don't trust your heart. Don't trust what you feel. Trust God and trust the Word of God. That Word of God and God will never fail you. But what we see, what we hear, and what we believe in our heart, think about with our heart and trust with our heart, will fail us. But God never fails. Please remember that. Amen. Amen. The giant of distrust. Let's read this today. Verse number 40, 1 Samuel 17. And he took his staff in his hand and he chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. The Philistine came on and drew near unto David and the man that bare the shield went before him. We talked about that last week, didn't we? How big that shield was. The only place that Goliath was vulnerable was right here, right here. And God knew exactly what was needed. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David and the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistines looked about and saw David, he disdained him for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beast of the field. And David said to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. Amen. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day into the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that in the earth may, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give it into our hand. Let's stop reading there this morning. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for allowing us the opportunity to gather together. And we ask you, Lord, now that you would just open up this scripture, Lord, that we might be receptive to it, that you might show us, Lord, those great truths that we need to learn. And Father, we want to thank you and praise you for your mercy and your goodness and your grace. And Father, I pray today, Lord, if there's one soul in this room that's struggling, that's uh, struggling with sin in their life, uh, some kind of a giant in their life that they can't seem to overcome, I pray, God, you would show them the truth from your word today of how they can overcome things, how they can defeat those things in their life that they seem to think are undefeatable. And Lord, I pray, Father, if there's one soul in this room that's lost and on their way to hell, that God, today might be that day of their salvation. And we pray, Father, you'd show them their need of salvation. Show them the gospel, the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus, sufficient for salvation. Now, Lord, please have your will and your way. And help us, Lord, to learn today and grow today. And Lord, we do once again pray, Father, for Israel. And Lord, we know that you know all of these things and none of these things have caught you by surprise. And Father, we know according to your word that some of these things are going to come to happen and the world is going to come against Israel, but you're going to defend them. And Father, we, we know these things are coming to pass as we read it in your scripture. But Lord, I pray that you'd help us to keep our eyes upon you. And Father, for these that are going to Israel to preach the gospel, to share the love of Jesus Christ, may they be emboldened, may they be emblazoned, may they stand firm in their conviction and boldly proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ. No matter the outcome, no matter what happens, Lord, give them courage and give them strength, Lord, please, in these days we live. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want you to notice this today. The men were afraid. They were not trusting in God. This is our problem today. We're filled with fear. We're not trusting in God. We trust in everything but God. We talked about this in the first week. We talked about this in the second week. And we're going to talk about this today because this is the biggest issue we have in our lives as Christians in 2023. We talk a good game, but we don't put our boots on. We don't lace up the boots. We don't ruck up. We don't suck it up and drive on. We don't get prepared for the battle. We think the battle belongs to everybody else. And according to this, the battle is the Lord's. 
I want you to realize that in every war, there are casualties. In every battle, there are casualties. And you and I need to understand it is very possible that we put our boots on, we ruck up, we get our armor on, we get our, our sword sharp, and we go into the battle, and it's very possible that you might be damaged, you might be injured, you might even be killed in the battle uh, for the Lord. And I want you to realize this is a possibility. We still have brothers and sisters all around this world who are suffering for the cause of Christ. They're out there in the world and they are preaching the gospel. They are frontline Christians. They are standing firm. They are standing strong. They don't cower. They don't back down. And they are dying for the cause of Christ. And there is a crown for them when they get to glory. There will be a special martyr's crown just for them. Folks, you and I are so backwards from true Christianity in America today. We think that Christianity is uh, somehow we're supposed to feel good. We're supposed to always be encouraged and uplifted. We're supposed to uh, just accept everybody in their sin and what they're doing. Uh, we're supposed to have people accept us when we're in sin, no matter what we're doing. And that's not Christianity. Christianity is holiness. It is a calling to holiness, separation from the world, separation unto God. When you separate from the world, you have automatically alienated that world. That world is at enmity with us, brethren. We're not to love the world. We're to love God. We're not to love the world. We're to love the things of God. We're not to love the world. We're to love the spirit of God and the word of God, the truth of God. But that's not how most of us are. Am I right or am I wrong? And so here we are in our generation. We have a, a warped sense of what Christianity is. In this generation, they had a warped sense of what being the army of Israel was. Oh, they knew the stories of the past, but they had not experienced those great victories on their own. And in even the small victories that they had experienced that God had given them, they had already forgotten it when they saw one giant. One giant standing in front of them and immediately all the victories of the past are wiped out of our mind That's the way we are today. We can have a victory over this little area in our life and that little area in our life. We can have victory over the language. We can have victory over some of the attitude. We can have victory over some of the sinful behavior. But then all of a sudden, God allows a greater battle to come your way and we forget the victory and we forget the victor. And we forget that the battle is the Lord's. We don't have to fight it. We have to surrender. When we surrender, we don't surrender to the enemy. We surrender to God. This is the problem we have. We are surrendering to the enemy. We're surrendering to doubt and discouragement and defeatism. Instead of surrendering to the conqueror, the victor, the battle is the Lord's. Is everybody with me this morning? So the men were afraid. They were not trusting God. Remember, the Bible tells us that the Lord is my strength. Is the Lord your strength today? Is the Lord your strength? Or do you go to the gym and pump iron so you can be strong? Because I want you to know as strong as you get, you're stronger than a bullet. I mean, you can be like Superman, but there's only one Superman. And that wasn't even a real man. That was made up, just in case you're not sure. He's not faster than a speeding bullet. He was not able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. That came out of somebody's imagination. You are not going to be able to outrun a bullet. You cannot jump a building in a single bound. Come on, y'all. Some of us eat so much we can barely waddle. You and I need to realize that the Lord is our strength. Now, we are in a battle today. We are in a battle for men's souls. We're in a battle for our heritage. We're in a battle. But instead of looking at the victor, instead of looking at the battle plan that God has given us, we look at the giant. We see that there are so many leaving church. We see there are so many walking away from God. We see so many people deconstructing their faith. And they're doing that because they never were of us to begin with. If they go out from us, they never were of us. And folks, you don't deconstruct salvation. It's impossible. But you can deconstruct religion all the time. We don't want to be religious. We want to be saved and set and secure in our Savior, right? The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in Him. It's the only thing your heart can trust in that won't fail you. 
You can put your trust in faith in military. You can put your trust in faith in finances. You can put your trust in faith in your home. But I'm here to tell you all of those things are going to fail you in one fell swoop. You need to put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's coming a day, dear American, where you're going to get up to go to the bank and there's not going to be any money in that bank. You're not going to be able to get a dime out of that bank. There's going to come a day, dear American, when you go to write a check or you go to use your little plastic card and your money is worthless and useless. You better already have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You better already be settled. You better already know that Jesus Christ is your strength. He's your sustainer. He's your provider. He's our rock. He's our shelter. He's our king. You better understand this, dear brother. One of these days, all that physical strength that you've got it's going to fail you. It's going to fail you. You're going to get older. I used to run six miles one day, 12 miles the second day. I was in shape. But all that was back then. It ain't now. I'm shaped, but it, this ain't much of one. Poor Jill. But are y'all listening to me? Your health will fail you. Your body will fail you. But your God will never fail you. And you need to understand that. Psalms 46.10, be still and know that I am God. Here's the other problem we have as Americans. We think, we talk a good game. We think somebody's going to come to our rescue, going to come to our defense. I'm here to tell you that our safety net as Americans is rapidly falling away. As a matter of fact, in some of the cities, some of the larger cities, they put things in the newspaper, put things out online. They put things out on the television. Please do not dial 911. We are overwhelmed and we will not be able to get to you unless if it is a a life or death situation. Take care of it yourself. Deal with it yourself because we can't get there. Folks, you and I need to realize that when that day comes, when it's oh dark 30 and somebody's kicked in your door and somebody's standing there wanting to harm you and your family, you better have a relationship with God. Yeah, you can dial 911. They'll get there in about 15 or 20 minutes, maybe. You better be ready to take care of yourself, defend your family, but you also better have your heart right with God. Why? Because God is the one who is the ultimate victor in every battle. Every battle. And in everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You and I need to understand we're living in the last days. This is what the last days looks like. It's dangerous. It's perilous. Yes, you need to learn how to protect yourself and defend yourself physically. But you better also understand that God is the ultimate victor, the ultimate conqueror in every battle, in everything in your life. And you better be close to him. Because when you're close to him, he'll give you a clarity of mind. He'll give you a a clear heart and a clear conscience. And it's something that we are missing in America. We don't have a clear mind. We don't have a clear heart. And we don't have a clean conscience. We're guilty before God because we put our trust in everything else besides him. It's true. We need to learn to be still. Just be still. You need to learn to come apart before you come apart. You need to learn to come apart and be still with God. You need to learn to turn that TV off. You need to learn to go outside and just sit. You need to learn to just get away from the electronics of our day. You need to learn to get away from all the people of our generation. You need to learn to go out by yourself, sit down in a quiet place, be still, and just learn of God. It is something that's missing. Our quiet times are missing. Our prayer times are missing. Our personal relationship, our personal walk with God is missing. We talk a good game. Oh, I'll pray for you. Oh, I'll pray for you. Oh, I'll lift that up in prayer right now. I'll pray for you today. And then we just drop it. Let me ask you a personal question. Please don't raise your hand because we're all guilty. When was the last time somebody said, hey, would you please pray for this? They're in a dire strait. They're in a desperate way. They're sick. They're they're in a financial uh, tight spot, whatever it is. Please pray for me. And you go, oh, yeah, I'll pray for you. And you never do. You don't take it to God because you don't really think God could do anything anyway. Let me tell you something. God is more able than you and I can ever even imagine. 
God is more capable than you and I can fathom. The hand of God is moved by prayer, dear brother. And the reason we have not is because we ask not. And sometimes we ask because we ask, we don't have it because we ask it amiss. All we want is what we want for ourselves and for our sake instead of glorifying God. You want to know something? Sometimes the greatest thing that ever happened to you is you find yourself flat on your back in a bed of affliction, suffering horribly with some terrible, dreadful disease, some dreadful sickness, some heart issue, some cancer issue, the only place you have is to look up to God and you will find that God is enough. Wish to God we'd find that out now while we're younger, while we're healthier, before that day comes. Because that day comes for all of us unless we die at a young age. The men were afraid, not trusting God, and Saul didn't trust in David's ability. Look at verse number 33. Saul didn't trust David. It says, and Saul said to David, thou art not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him for thou art but a youth and he a man of war from his youth. You're not able to do it. How many of y'all have had people tell you that? How many of y'all have had that happen to you? You're not able to do that. Think about this. And Christine made a perfect statement that goes along with this message. Now's not the time to tell any missionary that they're ignorant for doing what they're doing. Now's the time that all of us need to put on our missionary boots and get out there in the world and serve God. Now's the time. There may be no tomorrow. Now's the time. And for anybody that's out there serving God on the front line, serving God in a foreign place where there's war and there's there's, uh, the Islamic invasion that's going on around the world, praise God they're out there. Some of them are dying too, brethren. But they're more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. Saul didn't trust David's ability because he was too young. Don't ever count out somebody that's young. I want to tell you something. I was absolutely amazed on last Sunday night and Monday night at the preaching ability of that young man. I'm here to tell you, if you missed that, you missed something incredible. That young man was filled with the Spirit of God and the Word of God. He was permeated with the Word of God and he preached God's Word with power and conviction. What an amazing thing that was. For somebody that's not even 30 years old yet. I want you to understand something. Don't ever let anybody count you out because you're young. And don't let anybody count you out because you're old. You might be too old to physically fight a fight. You might be too old to physically go and do and serve and work and labor. But you're never too old to pray. You're never too old to carry things up into the presence of God. Do that spiritual warfare, which takes twice the effort and twice the work and twice the energy of physical labor. You get involved in a spiritual battle, brother. You get involved in spiritual warfare. You're going to be exhausted. Because you're not waging warfare against a man who gets tired. You're waging a warfare against a devil that never sleeps. Saul didn't trust in David's ability, but God did. Because God wasn't looking for David's ability. God was just looking for a willing willing person. I want you to know this today. God's still not looking at your ability. God doesn't call those that are equipped to do things. He equips those that are called. Are you willing to sacrifice? Are you willing to surrender? It's all or nothing with God, baby. You sell out. You got to be a sellout to Jesus. You can't have one foot in the world and one foot with Jesus. you got to jump the fence. If you're going to experience this, if you're going to know what I'm talking about, if you're going to defeat giants in your life, you've got to absolutely surrender everything to God. Your family to God. Your finances to God. Your your home to God. Your vehicle to God. Everything. Saul tried to get David to trust in his armor. Look at verse 38. Y'all still with me? Saul armed David with his armor and he put a helmet of brass upon his head and and, uh, uh, also he armed him with a coat of mail and David girded his sword upon his armor and he essayed to go for he had not proved it. Look at this. Saul tried to get David to trust in his armor. What was wrong with Saul? Why didn't Saul put on his armor and go out and face Goliath? It was his responsibility. He was God called to be king, was he not? Wasn't he a head and shoulder above everybody else? Wasn't he a great big man? Yes, he was. He was a big bad boy. Why didn't he go out and fight? Because fear overruled him. Do you realize that if Saul went out there to face that giant in the name of the Lord, he would have defeated that giant? 
but he wouldn't put his own armor on himself. He made fun of David. He was mocking and making fun of David. And don't you think for a minute he wasn't. Here, boy, you're going to go out and fight a, a man-sized battle. Put on this armor because I'm a man. I'm bigger than everybody else. You know what irritates me more than anything in the world? People who think they're bigger than anybody else. Do you realize that there is but a ounce of difference between us all? I don't care whether you're five foot tall or seven foot tall. You ain't nothing in the sight of God. Nothing. And if God wants to defeat you, you're going to be defeated. Do you understand that? And why big people pick on little people, I have no idea in the world because most little people will hurt you. <laughs> and you don't even know it. But here we are in this generation, this world we're living in. We focus everything on size and ability and physical strength and physical prowess and physical looks. Can they run faster? Can they throw a ball better? Can they? You know, it's all that stuff. God saw little David. God saw a little boy, a young boy, a youth, who had enough gumption about him to say, I can't defeat that guy, but the battle ain't mine anyway. Amen. I'm just going to trust God to do it. Amen. Somebody's got to do it. And if y'all are too afraid to do it, here I am, I'll go. What? Hey, that was more of a man than the mighty man Saul. Wasn't it? Oh, yeah. Y'all do realize that in just a few years, it's going to make Saul so mad he wants to kill David because people are going to be singing a song, Saul killed his thousands, but David is ten thousands. Yeah. This is going to come back to backfire on Saul yeah. in a big way. Look at this. The Bible says David is saved to go for he had not approved it. That word is saved means, means to judge critically, to put it to the test. He said, I am not going out there in this armor. I've never put it to test. I've never used it. I'm not skilled in this. But what was he skilled in? He said, I, I have a sling and there came a, a bear and God gave me the power. And a lion and God gave me the power. There have been enemies who've attacked and God gave me the power. Yeah. Do y'all realize that? Yeah. I want you to think about this for just a minute. David had learned in whom he trusted. Look at verse 34. And David said unto Saul, thy servant kept his father's sheep and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. I went out after him and smote him and delivered him out of his mouth. Which one of y'all in here would go after a bear or a lion? You want to know why David did that? Because David was responsible for the livelihood, the protection of those sheep. Do you want to know why David was mighty? Why David stood up? Why David went after both a lion and a bear? You want to know why? Because he took the responsibility, even though he was the nothing of nothing, to be a shepherd is the lowest of, of all humanity. It's lower than people who clean out septic tanks. And if you clean out septic tanks, thank God you're out there. Because I don't want to do it. Amen. Amen. But to be a shepherd was the lowliest of low. Is everybody following that? Yes. But he took it so seriously. He was not going to let his father down. He was not going to let his family down. That took money out of his father. That took food off of their table. He was not going to allow this to happen. He took it seriously. So he stood up against that bear and he stood up against that lion and he knew that he was no match for those things. But God could give him victory. Amen. And he relied upon God. God put David as a shepherd boy. Yes. And David understood that. Oh, if we would remember that tomorrow when you go to work and you hate those people you work with, God puts you there. You can be a Saul or you can be a David. You can be a Saul and act like you know more than everybody else does. Act like you're better than everybody else does. Look down like you do more work than anybody else does. and Like you're mistreated and talked about. And nobody likes you. Or you can be like little David and go, thank you, God, 
I'll take this little nothing place and I'll take this little nothing job and I'll work in this little nowhere nook and I will do my best because it's what you gave me to do and I want to do it to the best of my ability for your honor and your glory and I will do it for you, God. Amen. The choice is yours. You can be a Saul or you can be a David. Those places you work and those people you work with, they're giants in your life. They're giants in your heart. They're giants in your mind. Are they not? Yes. Does anybody work out there? Yes. You know what I'm talking about. But David learned in whom he could trust. Verse 37, David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the bear, the Lord will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. The Lord, the Lord, the Lord. Amen. Huh. So will the Lord deliver you? The answer is yes. Yes. He may deliver you because he gives you a victory over that enemy or he may deliver you through the avenue of death, but we are always delivered by God. Amen. Sometimes he delivers you by the avenue of learning from your great failure. Sometimes you think you're going to be mighty and show God how mighty you are and how you're going to show God how much you love him and you're going to do this. That's not relying on God. When you're faced with the obstacle, when you're faced with the giant, then, my dear friend, you just rely on the power of God to see you through it. Is everybody following me? Because David didn't know when the lion was showing up. And David didn't know when the bear was showing up. And David was sent down there with some cheese and wine and bread to give to his brothers. He didn't know Goliath was there. But God did. Now look at this. Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. It makes no sense that this little boy is going to fight a giant. Romans 8, 28. How many of y'all believe that's still in the Bible for you? We know that all things work together for good to them that are called according to his purpose. Folks, everything works together for good. You may not understand why somebody treats you the way they treat you. You may not understand why somebody you love doesn't do what you think they ought to do. You may not understand why you think that you got a bad deal in life. Guess what? God knew. Now, either you deal with it with God... And you allow God to work in you and through you to overcome that jealousy, that anger, and that bitterness, or that anger, that jealousy, and that bitterness is going to eat you alive. Yep. Yes. The choice is yours. You can be a Saul and sit back and wait on everybody else to fight your battle, or you can be like David and just step into the fray and come what may, God's able. God's able. And get your eyes on the real enemy. The real enemy was within those people, not without those people. The real enemy was fear. The real enemy was they were afraid to fail. The real enemy is they were not willing to pay it all. They were not willing to surrender all. They were not willing to be like David. They were not willing to step foot on that battlefield because they were looking at the obstacles. They were looking at the odds. They were looking at all this stuff. And folks, understand what happened. They were not trusting in God. And there was nothing to trust when they looked at themselves. And that's where we are. We're not trusting God. If we trusted in God, we'd be out there winning people to Jesus. If we trusted God, we'd be out there telling people about Jesus. We're not. Because we don't trust ourselves. We look around at church and think that somebody else ought to do it. Somebody else ought to do it. Somebody else ought to do it. We never understand that we all ought to be doing it. We all need to surrender. We all need to separate ourselves unto holiness. We all need to be used of God. We all need to be filled with the Spirit of God. We all, all, all of us. If we had the heart of David, the first minute that giant walked out there and defied God, we'd all run on him and slew him. Amen. You see, the Philistines were also afraid. That's why they sent Goliath. Because the Philistines knew that if they fought Israel, 
they would be defeated. The enemy knows he's defeated today. Are y'all with me? The devil knows that he's defeated. He has but a short time. He has but just so much time. Folks, guess what? He's got more time than we do. He's been working on people for the last, uh, last 6,000 years. We don't live that long, do we? We live 70, 80, 90, 100 years and we're done. And then he just, those demons just go on to work on somebody else. They got all the time in the world. They don't need to sleep. They don't need to slumber. You and I need to stop and understand this. And so what happens is the devil battles us. We get battled and then we're afraid. The victory's already ours. Uh, you're more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who loved you. We are saved. We're sealed. We're set. We're already seated in heavenly places. But we're afraid to go out there. We're afraid to face them. We will not separate ourselves. We will not live holy lives. We will not put away sin because we're afraid of what people will think about us. We're afraid that people we work with will think we're strange or weird. And the whole time they're dying and going to hell because you're not a real witness for Jesus. You'll think that your, neighbor, your neighbors will think you're strange. Your, your children, your, your grandchildren will think you're odd. Guess what they probably do anyway? The sad reality is the devil is winning and they're dying and going to hell. They're leaving churches like ours that preach the Bible. And if they do go to church, they're going to places that are just gospel lightness. They're not preaching the word. They're not calling them to holiness. They're accepting them in their sin, telling them they're okay, we're okay, everybody's okay, and Jesus paid it all, so therefore everybody goes to heaven. That's not the truth of the Scripture. Stop being afraid. Put on the whole armor of God. That's, that's really what he's talking about here. When David had learned in whom he could trust, then notice this in Ephesians 6 is the armor of God, the helmet, the breastplate, the, 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 the girdle, the, the boots, all of it, folks. All of that. Read it for yourself. Ephesians 6, all of that armor fits us perfectly. Amen. And it fits us so that we'll stand against the wiles of the devil. We'll be able to stand in our day. Let me ask you right now before I go to the last one. And I'll be done in about five minutes. The last one's a short one. Let me ask you this. Are you more like Saul or are you more like David? Or are you like the whole armies of Israel or the whole armies of the Philistines? You're just waiting on somebody else to do it for you. Waiting on somebody else to step up. You're hiding in the background. Hoping somebody else will get picked first. Hiding in the back. Hide your eyes from somebody looking for somebody to pick so that they don't see you. Well, guess what? God looks upon the heart. And the reason God's not going to get you to do anything is because you don't want to. And you want to know why you live defeated, discouraged, downcast lives? You want to know why you can never have victory over sin in your life? You keep going back to the same things over and over and over, and they have destroyed you. Some of you, your families are right on the brink of destruction. Your marriages are on the brink of failure. Your life is on the brink of failure. Some of you are so far in debt, you can't get, your, get out of it if you, if you worked 14 jobs. Ain't nobody coming to your rescue because God has already given you the rescue and you have said no. There was a boat one time. God sent a flood. Sent a boat big enough for everybody that needed to, wanted to, to get on it. That boat would have been just fine. But everybody said no. Nope, I ain't doing that. That's weird, man. I'm not getting in that thing. That's weird. Why would I get in a boat? It has never even rained. Why would I get in a boat? 
And why would I get in a boat with a bunch of stinking animals? Why would I do that? That doesn't make any sense. And now they go in your gas tank. They were all killed. Folks, those people didn't trust God. And they didn't trust the man of God who was trying to tell them that there was a way to escape an impending judgment. This is the way it is in America. The vast majority of people sitting on church pews are lost and on their way to hell. They are trusting in being good people. They're trusting in praying a prayer. They're trusting in, in their religion. They're trusting in some work that they have done, but they are not trusting in Jesus. And they're looking around at everybody else who trusts in everything else but Jesus, and they're justifying themselves. And if Jesus should come right now, today, right now, during the preaching hour, all around America, if the Lord Jesus would come, and even so, come Lord Jesus and call His true disciples to Him, I wonder... How many of y'all would be looking around like, what happened? Where'd Paul go? Why is his clothes up there? That's weird. That's weird. How come there's so many people still here? Uh, that's weird. Where'd they all go? Where'd that handful of them weirdos go? Where'd that handful of them ones that raise their hands and sing and cry? Where's that handful of them to go to the altar and weep? Where's that, weir where's that handful of them weirdos? Where'd they go? Folks, don't trust yourself. Trust God. And don't look around at everybody else going, well, I'm just as good as they are. I'm just, I'm okay. If they're okay, I must be okay. Ain't none of us okay without Jesus. That's right. I'm convinced that one day the Lord's going to come and I, I would love for Him to come during the church hour. Amen. Love for Him to come during the church hour. You know, the church hour is about the middle of the night over yonder. <laughs> so it'd be about right, wouldn't it? Let's keep going. The last one is that giant of dominance. You give me just a few more minutes and we're done. Y'all still there? Yes. I believe we ought to have an altar call right now. It's so quiet out there, somebody needs it. Amen. There's a giant of dominance. Goliath thought to dominate David. Verse 41 to 44, we, we read that. We talked about the fact the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog? You're going to send a boy to do a man's job in my dog. I'm going to kill you, boy. I'm going to destroy you, boy. I'm going to kill you, destroy you, make you nothing. I'm going to let everybody watch me crush you. That's the way the devil is right now to the church in America. They are killing us. Maybe not physically, but spiritually, we're about as dead as four o'clock. Lack of tears, lack of brokenness, lack of repentance. You know it and I know it. Yes. Goliath thought he was going to dominate David, but Goliath overlooked the obvious. The obvious was when David walked up to him, there wasn't any fear in David's eyes. Amen. I love these people that show up to church every now and again. I love these people that like to come whenever we eat. They just show up. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but you can have chicken out there and we got 400 people show up to eat and 180 or whatever it is in here on Sunday morning. Come on. And they always want to talk. Talk all spiritual. But they all have weird things to say. Well, I just don't believe like you do, Pastor Paul. Sorry about your luck. Don't affect me at all. Well, Pastor Paul, you, you know. You, you know that if you sin, then you've got to get saved over again. You know that. No, I don't. Because the Bible don't say that. 
So what sin is it that I have to do where I lose my salvation? Draw me a line. Well, now you know. I can't draw a line for you, but I know it for me. No, you don't. I'm a walking billboard of sin. I fail God 24-7 because I live in this flesh, in, in this sin-cursed body, on this sin-cursed earth, and I am not glorified yet. My salvation is not contingent upon me. It's contingent upon the faithfulness of Jesus. I can show you from the Bible. And I get this. Well, I, I don't, you know, I'm not worried about what the Bible says. I know how I felt. Excuse me? I know how I felt. Well, let me tell you, I'm feeling a lot of things right now myself. <laughs> but we walk by faith and not by sight. Amen. I get them. They find me. They find me. They seek me out. I must have, hey, talk to me written on my face or something. Well, Pastor Paul, you know, I just don't believe like you do. I just, you know, I, we like your church. Yeah, you like our chicken. <laughs> like, we just love your church, but you know, we're just, we just don't believe that way. We're, you know, we believe that there are some predestined for hell and some predestined for heaven. Well, sorry about your love. Which one are you? How about your children? Isn't it amazing all those that are predestined for heaven, their children also are predestined? Have you ever thought about that? It's their children that get saved? Everybody else goes to hell? Is that what it is? Really? Are y'all still there? You see, when bad stuff comes into you, you want to dominate somebody. Had that this week. Somebody just constantly wanting to bash me, barrage me, belittle me. Folks, go ahead. You're not fighting me. You're fighting Jesus. Because I don't allow you to affect me. Amen. Amen. Everybody with me? Amen. So look at this. There's no fear in David's eyes. Why? Because David had already settled the matter that the battle is the Lord's. David had already established the fact that God had empowered him to kill the lion and the bear, and this giant is actually nothing compared to a lion and a bear. A lion and a bear are faster, more ferocious. This big old rascal is going to lumber along slowly. He's a big old oaf. And he thinks his size can win the battle. He thinks that shield out in front of him can stop any weapon of warfare. Well, David's going to come at him with something that God made, not something that man made. Amen. And there's a difference. Second Timothy says, God has not given us a spirit of fear. Are you there? I'm almost done. But a power, love, and a sound mind. Look at this, and we're almost done. God was with David, and God is with us. Amen. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Yes. Amen. Know you not that you're the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Are you saved this morning? Let me ask you this. Are you saved? I mean, do you know for sure? Good, because if the Lord comes for we're done, I want us all to go. I would rather to be just a few sitting around going, what happened? Than the majority sitting around going, what happened? <laughs> God is ultimately the dominant one in every battle. The battle is the Lord's, verse 45 to 50. And please always remember this. Victory itself is a gift of the Lord. Amen. The victory is the gift. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Who's the them? Who's the them? All the naysayers, all the ones who hate God, all the ones that mock and make fun of God, all the ones that tell you that they are mightier than God, smarter than God, more brilliant than God, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. So I want you to see this and we're done. We'll have an invitation hymn. And thank you, Lord, that my voice held out. It's actually stronger now than when I started. When we have the giant of doubt, there's God's promises. When you have the giant of despair, there's God's grace and mercy. 
When you have that giant of disproportion, there's God's power. God is the strong one. When you have that, that giant of distrust that comes into you, and that's really what this message was all about today. You have got to understand God's Word is what settles it. You've got a Bible in front of you. Read it, learn it, know it, hide it in your heart. Amen. This is your weapon of warfare. Sharpen it. Wield it, yield it, and do some damage with it. Every time you tell a sinner the gospel story, you are wielding the Word of God because the gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection is God's Word. And you are doing damage to the enemy. When those giants want to dominate you, you already have victory. If you're saved today, you are already seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. If you're saved today, you're sealed by the Spirit of God unto the day of redemption. If you're saved today, greater is He that's in you than he that's in the world. If you're saved today, you are the dwelling place, the tabernacle, the temple of the living God. If we are the dwelling place, the tabernacle, and the temple of the living God, we must stand to fight against the giants who want to defile our temple, who want to defile the temple of the living God. We must stand against the giants in our land who want to destroy our temple, who want to tear down that temple, who want to make mockery of that temple. We need to stand up as giants in this day and fight the fight. Stand against them and fight the fight. Don't use man-made weapons. Use what God made. Amen. The giants will fall when you go and fight God's way. Amen. Right now, there are some of you, you've got a giant that's facing your marriage and a giant that's facing your family, and you brought the giant into your own house. You've been playing with the giant. Funny thing about giants, there are kids once too. You play with them and entertain them. Next thing you know, they're a whole lot bigger and stronger than you. And they think they can dominate you. But they don't know God. There's some of you need to do business with God this morning. Let's all stand. I've done my best the last three weeks to preach everything the Lord has given to me about this. And it's my prayer that you will surrender if you haven't already. It's open right now. If you need to come, you come.